Welcome. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and we are delighted that you have tuned us in. You know, you're an important part of our EWTN family, and we would love to hear from you. All you need to do is send us an email, jimandjoy at EWTN.com. Well, I know there's some things you wanted to share today about, we're going to have a great show about the spiritual motherhood of priests. We have these two lovely ladies all the way from Canada yes. who've come to be with us, Maria Peroni and Maria Nicastro, and they are co-founders of this beautiful apostolate, which is Spiritual Motherhood of Priests. Right. You really want to hear what God has done, what the Holy Spirit has done, because our priests need yes. our prayers. Yes. Our priests need to be held up and suspended right. by that um, beautiful yeah. intercessory way that they have. So, so we have these ladies on. Yes. Maybe there's ladies that are going to be called today to be intercessors on behalf of a priest, on behalf of the clergy. And this week we're celebrating the life of Father James E. Coyle, a wonderful missionary priest from Ireland, County Roscommon, Ireland. So this fits with the show. We're remembering his coming, like so many missionary priests at the turn of the 20th century to come and bring the good news of Christ mm. and the Catholic Church to America. And uh, Father Coyle was just an incredible human being, um, bright, well-educated, educated in Rome, was ordained in about 1896 and uh, came over shortly thereafter to America, was planting churches and working in a school uh, in Mobile, Alabama, after about six or seven years came up to Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, at 1904 to 1921 was the years that he worked there uh, at St. Paul's, which would later become our cathedral, mm -hmm. and uh, had an incredible ministry there among Catholics and non-Catholics alike. But about 1915 or so, an anti-Catholic bigotry really rose up very strongly, and people were finding out this is a way to win elections, go anti-Catholic and mobilize people. There's a group called the True Americans that rose up. They were anything but true Americans and really putting down Catholics in numerous ways. And it was a very difficult bigotry and, and uh, grew more and more uh, violent. Mm -hmm. Ku Klux Klan, True Americans, and Father Coyle was the face of Catholicism. He had a beautiful face, a very handsome man, very articulate man. Um, and he would share about the church. But at this time, there were accusations against the church like the Knights of Columbus, he was a member of the Knights of Columbus, were a violent group, they're stockpiling weapons. Uh, little girls are being kidnapped, being brought into different Catholic facilities. Uh, the Knights of Columbus are going to start an insurrection. Uh, the Pope is moving to America. And all this all stuff. All lies. And Father Coyle was very, he was the face of Catholicism. Mm -hmm. He would write. He would have open discussion. He'd discuss through the papers. And uh, we come to find out over time that his life was under threat for two and a half years. Through FBI came uh, to Bishop Allen at that time and said, he's, he's, his life is in danger. Mm -hmm. Finally, Father Coyle, who believed in the sanctity of all human life, equality among all people, uh, did a wedding between a dark-skinned Puerto Rican Catholic guy and a convert girl uh, from another Christian tradition. And he was asked to do this wedding. This little girl, this girl who was now 18, had met with Father Coyle years back as a little girl and wanted to know about Catholicism, he shared with her. Later on in the trial testimony, uh, she said that her father said that he would kill Father Coyle if ever she went back there again. Anyway, Father Coyle says that he'll do the wedding. The night before, he says to some of the clergy, I think you know, old man Stevenson, that was the name of the girl, Ruth Stevenson, might kill me. So he does the wedding. Uh, this is uh, 95 years ago, coming up this Wednesday or Thursday. And uh, he tells the few people that were there, his sister, Marcella, who came to accompany him to pray for him from Ireland. Uh, another priest, I think those were the only two there. He said, stand off to the side mm -hmm. because you know, he felt like this could be dangerous. Did the wedding, told her to go back and tell, you know, make sure the father knew. And then as he did each evening, he would say his prayers out on the porch in, in, in a, you know, a swing. Right. So he would do his breviary prayers each night. And evidently the father, who was a minister, in another tradition, who worked in the courthouse right next door to St. Paul's, and uh, he was a marrying parson. So all this, all her father did was marriages. It's so ironic that he would be so irate about this marriage when all he did was marriages of, of all kinds of people. 
And so he was waiting for Father Coyle and uh, shot three times at Father Coyle while he was saying his prayers. And one of the bullets went right around his temple, out of his skull, and hit St. Paul's Church and assassinated Father Coyle in cold blood. Um, the sister Marcella found him, a terrible scene. He died shortly thereafter, about 40 minutes after at St. Vincent's Hospital, the hospital that the pastor before him had begun. This started, the guy who shot him walked through a window that was open in the courthouse, turned himself in with the gun and said, I just shot the priest. It was one of the largest trials of the 20th century. Would a man be convicted for shooting a priest? It's, it's a long trial, uh, a week long trial. He was found not guilty. It was a Klan jury, predominantly judge. You can find all these facts in Sharon Davies' work, uh, Rising Road, I think that's up there, as well as fathercoil.org, a website I began. I have a little book there as well called Killed in the Line of Duty because his bishop said, Father Coyle was a martyr to duty. He was killed in the line of duty. He performed this wedding between two people who were able to marry, they, they had the right to marry, and he was shot in cold blood with nobody to help him. Mm -hmm. uh, so today we're thinking about vocations and about callings, and we see this more and more throughout the country, a priest right. being attacked and persecuted for a variety of reasons. We need uh, men and women, especially women, to intercede and to pray for our clergy and to pray that God would raise up more clergy uh, to go into the harvest. So that's our show for today. You're not going to want to miss it. So we invite you, if you want that book, you can go to Religious Catalog. It's Rising Road by Sharon Davies. It's a great read. It's item number 79792. You can always go to the website, fathercoil.org. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we will have more with two beautiful ladies who came all the way from Canada to share their wonderful apostata. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Well, you're an important part of our family, and we would love to hear from you today. If you have a question for today's guest, give us a call during this live broadcast. If you're in North America, call us at 1-800-221-9460. Outside of North America, you can reach us at area code 205-271-2980, or you can always send us an email Jim and Joy at EWTN.com, and hopefully we can use your question right here on the air. Well, today we bring you all the way from Canada, Maria Peroni and Maria Nicastro, and these lovely ladies are co-founders of an apostolate called Spiritual Motherhood of Priests. It's spiritualmotherhoodofpriest.ca. You can go to their website and look them up. Well, ladies, welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy. We're excited that you're yeah. here. Thank and you. what we Thank want you. you to do, one can go and then the other one could go, is just tell us a little bit about your spiritual journey, how you got to be where you are right now, co-founding this unbelievable ministry. Well, in my case, um, I was, um, next month, we're going to be celebrating, my husband and I are going to be celebrating our 42nd Praise wedding anniversary. We have a daughter. And um, I came to Canada in 1958 with my, uh, my parents, my four brothers and me. And uh, we lived a very loving family, but cradle Catholics. Okay. I didn't understand anything. I really didn't know much about my faith. Um, the only thing I do remember is watching my mother recite the rosary, but in private. Mm -hmm. I went to an all-girls school with nuns, but still didn't understand. So let's fast forward. In 1992, I had two back surgeries, mm -hmm. and I ended up in the hospital with, for a month. Mm -hmm. And at the time, um, I remember there was a family friend that was in the hospital and um, he was a patient. And he says to me, Maria, when you go into the surgery on Friday, just say, Jesus, 
Jesus, Jesus. And I did. And we just left it at that. Yeah. But I was in there a month. And then at that, just before, the night before that I was supposed to be discharged, I went to bed. And all of a sudden, I got woken up by loud noises. And I didn't understand what was going on. So I got up. And my roommate, during that month, she was in a coma. So basically, I was alone in that room. And I thought, what's happened? So I, I went around and I saw that all the medical equipment was on the floor, but she wasn't in her bed. So I checked the bathroom and there she was, not knowing how she got there. So I called um, all the medical people and they came, they came rushing, they took her and they did what I guess what they had to do with her. But I continued, um, you know, and I was shaken up by that. But I was so tired, and I went to sleep. It was a very light sleep. But all of a sudden, I woke up. And I was staring at the wall of the Ottawa Sick Hospital, and this most beautiful, beautiful, brilliant face, <laughs> this vision, and I knew it was Jesus. It was brilliant, and it was like um, the scamp image of the Divine Mercy. However, I didn't know anything about Divine Mercy, mm -hmm. and it was just basically up to here. Mm -hmm. And But what really touched me is that that smile, that love that was coming into my heart, that peace, that warmth, and I just was <laughs> mesmerized by the whole thing. I was just crying and crying, and. And I started thinking about all my, my life and my sins. And, but I looked up at the wall again. I was trying to focus. And I said, no, it, it can't be. It just can't be. But he was still there. Mm -hmm. And he was just smiling at me. Mm -hmm. And he showed me that love. And that's what, you know, it's too hard to describe, yeah. really, because it's, it's just amazing. Yeah. I've never seen I've never seen that again, and but I understood his mercy. Yeah. And and then three years, about three years later, I was at <clears throat> church at St. Mary's, and uh, Father George Kosicki came to Mar St. Mary's, and it was a Lenten mission. And um, we ended up going downstairs to watch the movie, Time for Mercy. And he showed us the skimp image of of the, of the divine mercy. And that face came up again. I've never seen it before. And all of a sudden, wow. I found out it was the divine mercy image. And I started crying. And it made me think again, three years prior to that. So that's what it was. Mm -hmm. And I just started going into, I, I wanted to soak up everything about divine mercy because he made me understand, you know, his love, his mercy. And it was like, I was infused by that mercy, mm -hmm. and I needed to be forgiven. But I wanted to, I was in love. I wanted to tell everybody, my family, my friends. You know, it's like when you fall in love with mm -hmm. someone and you just want to let the whole world know, well, there was nothing more important than the love that I, that I experienced. And that's when I started to delve deep mm -hmm. into, yeah. into that. Powerful, powerful encounter. Maria right. Nicastro, tell yes. us a little bit about your own journey. My own journey. Yeah. Well, I, I've been married for almost 33 years. I got married yeah. very young, Italian, you know. And um, I have three children. A lot of Italians on the show today, you know. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of Italian <laughs> yeah. good stuff. Um, yeah, so 33 years, been married. I, I, I run a business with my husband in the heart of Little Italy in Ottawa. And uh, I'm going to be my uh, grandmother in January, first, first time grandmother. Um, I have three beautiful daughters. And I grew up in a family of, we were four children. One of my siblings um, had epilepsy since he was 15 months old. Uh, of course, Italian family, extremely loving. But we had our trials. We understood suffering. Um, as time went on, and, um, and I should point out, I, I went to a public school. My brother had epilepsy, so the, the better help 
for mm -hmm. my brother was at a public school. Mm -hmm. I knew nothing. I did go to church every week with my family, Italian church. So it was, it was something that didn't penetrate in my heart. Mm -hmm. um, time went on. Um, when my father was, was 50 years old, my father uh, became ill with prostate cancer. And I think that that was the beginning. I was 20, 26 at that time. That was the beginning of a real faith life, even though I had had, had other little experiences. Um, God to me was God. He wasn't mm -hmm. a personal God, uh, although I saw him as a father, a father of creation, my mm -hmm. father. I had faith, but I wasn't catechized. And um, my, when my father got ill, my father was the apple of my eye. Just thinking of him, I get emotional. And so I decided that, you know, I'm going to try this prayer thing. I found a prayer card uh, to Our Lady. And I, I began to pray that, that prayer. And what I started seeing, what I felt, was a peace come over me. And I thought, well, is this in my mind? Because I do feel a peace. So I did notice that. So if I fast forward three years uh, later, um, my father was in the hospital. It was a time, 10-day vigil we had for him, many family members. We filled up, <laughs> we filled up that room. And I decided to take a moment to go to the chapel uh, just to be alone and pray to God, pray to Him because He makes me feel peace and mm -hmm. I, I did need to feel that peace again. And so I decided to go downstairs. It's interesting because we both were, were touched at the same hospital. We did mm -hmm. not know each other, mm -hmm. had no clue who each other wow. was. God works in mysterious ways. But I, I knelt down in the chapel and I just got to the point, I guess, of surrender. And I said, you know, uh, God would never call him anything but because I didn't know him. I didn't know Jesus. Um, you know, I don't know what you're going to do at this point with my father. But I said, you know, I, I know you could do miracles. I've heard that you could do miracles. And I said, but do what you wish, but please let us know that, that you are with us, uh, especially because my mother had to deal with my brother and all of the health problems. And of course, me being the oldest, I ha you mm -hmm. have a different type sure. of heart when yeah. you're the oldest. You know, your, your heart is always with your siblings. And so at that very moment, I said, Lord, you know, uh, if you show us that you're with us, then I give you, I started naming off body parts, to be quite mm -hmm. honest, mm -hmm. my hands, my mm -hmm. eyes. Mm -hmm. I, it was just a point of surrender. Mm -hmm. There was nothing else I could do. And at that moment, um, I was frozen. And different things began to happen in the room which I won't get into because of uh, time and pressure. Many things began to happen, but I couldn't move. And what I saw, what I understood after the fact, was, um, was the persons of, of the Holy Trinity, um, Father and Son, and um, the movement of the Holy Spirit. And what was happening in that moment, I didn't know, I found out after the fact, was that I was being infused with different truths. Uh, the only thing that I could utter at that moment was, you're what I've been waiting for. Wow. I was so filled, mm. so filled. Um, there's nothing that can compare to God's love, absolutely nothing, no human love, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. You know, that void that we have inside of us can only be filled by yeah. Him. Mm -hmm. And um, so I left feeling like, Jello, <laughs> having received the greatest peace, the greatest unconditional love that I've ever felt. And I walked up to my mother and I didn't know how to tell her, but I said, Mom, you know, I said, I think I saw God and Daddy's going to die. Oh. So I did know many mm -hmm. things after the fact that I didn't know how I knew. Yeah. I didn't know about infusion. I didn't know about any of that. But I knew that I was different mm -hmm. and I would never be the same. Mm -hmm. Um, my father did die and something that I wished would never happen and, and I fought it to the end with the Lord. It was interesting because at the moment he died I felt joy because I knew that God was real. Mm -hmm. I knew that he was going to be with him. It was the most beautiful moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and after that the Lord really did take me under his, his wing. I had no clue about anything. and. I was just soaking up God 
for weeks or for months. Mm -hmm. And it was at that time that he made me understand that sin exists. He, I remember the memories being flooded into me, even going back to my childhood, even taking candy from a store. I didn't know what sin mm -hmm. was, and he was teaching <clears throat> me. He taught me about human dignity. Mm -hmm. He taught me about a, a feminine dignity, what it is to be a child of the Father, what it is to be a daughter of the Father. And I was just filled with mm -hmm. an incredible peace, joy, love, um, especially that it was the Holy Trinity. I did not know Our Lady. I came to know Our Lady later. Um, and the interesting thing about Our Lady was that my mother for some time could not get pregnant. Uh, and she had prayed to Our Lady, uh, the Immaculate Conception to be exact. And uh, in a dream one evening, uh, Our Lady appeared to my mother in the form of a statue, which they carry. You know how they do the processions in Italy? Mm -hmm. And she cried out, Immaculata, Immaculata, give me a child like the one you have in your arms. And at that moment, the statue was put down, and Our Lady came out forth from the statue as as the true woman and looked at my mother, smiled and nodded her head and I was conceived that month. Mm -hmm. So just that alone brought me a closeness. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I often say to Our Lady, Mother, you prayed me into being, now pray me into holiness. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> beautiful. Well, you both have had tremendous encounters with the Lord many years back. I know from Joy and I reading about you both that it a lot flows out of that deep intimacy with the Lord mm -hmm. that you began to move in intercessory prayer for various people, various groups. But yeah. fast forward, how did you both meet and how did you move into this whole realm of uh, this idea of intercessory prayer for priests? Well, um, back in, in 1996, I had a prayer group. Um, there was a, a beautiful friend of mine from Toronto, a very holy woman. And, you know, she had said to me, um, I think you need to start a prayer group. And because I had spoken to her about that love, that mercy, um, and, and all the pain and suffering that was going on in, in my family, because we went through a lot of illnesses and that, and, and so we would just go to that all the time, to the prayer, to the Divine Mercy. And of course, Our Lady, she held my hand every step of the way. But we, so we started the prayer group, and it was an Italian prayer group, and it was called Maria Regina del Vaticano, which is, and it was for the vocations to the priesthood and the sanctification of priests. So every Thursday we, we would be praying for, for the priests, and then in 19, um, in, in 2007, um, I was just watching uh, something on, on the internet that was browsing and the Zenith News had come up and said that, that there was going to be a document on spiritual maternity. And everything that was explained in that article was actually almost everything mm -hmm. that I was doing mm -hmm. all along since 1996. And I, I was so excited about it, and, I, and it just brought me to tears. So then, in um, a month later, December 8, 2007, the document came out, the Eucharistic Adoration for the Sanctification of Priest and Spiritual Maternity. And I was so excited about it. I wanted to, to share it. Um, I spoke to my spiritual director about it. And because I had the Divine Mercy Cynical, I thought, you know, spiritual and corporal works of mercy. Isn't this something that we could all do? You know, especially that they were asking for, for women to, to pray and intercede for our priests. So I shared it um, with my spiritual director. He gave me the green light and I explained it to, to my cynical. Mm -hmm. And um, so in 2008, um, for about a year, we were, in, we were praying but not the concept that we have mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, since Marie and I, you know, we've done a lot of different ministries together, I wanted to share it with, with Maria. And, um, and we talked about how could this unfold. She liked it, but the timing wasn't mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. well, let's pause right there. We're speaking about the spiritual motherhood of priests 
And uh, we're going to take a break at this point. We'll be back. We want to hear from you because I have a sense that the Lord might be calling numerous of you, no matter what age you are, you ladies out there. And maybe this has already been working in your heart, this pure love for priests and to intercede for them. You're going to want to hear more about this story, about this wonderful apostolate. We'll be right back. Please don't go away. Welcome back. Well, remember, we want you to be a part of our show. So if you have a question for our two Marias today, give us a call during the live broadcast. If you're in North America, call us at 1-800-221-9460 outside North America. You can reach us at area code 205-271-2980. You can always send us an email, jimandjoy at ewtn.com, and hopefully we can use your question on the air. And don't forget that after the show to contact EWTN Religious Catalog to get your copy of Mother Angelica's book, Answers, Not Promises. Mother's wit and wisdom shines forth as she offers straightforward solutions to life's puzzling moment. And if you lived a minute, sometimes it gets really puzzling. Mm -hmm. And that answer is not promises. You can order it by going to EWTNRC.com or by calling one 800 854-6316 and it's item number 80046. Be sure to get that book. Well, right now we're having this wonderful conversation with Maria Peroni and Maria Nicastro. They are co-founders of the Spiritual Motherhood of Priests. What does that mean? We want the both of you now to yeah. tell us what all about this apostolate, how people can get involved, what God has done, what the Rome has done. Tell us the beautiful story yeah, about your apostolate. Tell us the apostolate. timetable of it actually coming to pass because you were speaking about how this was like percolating and about to happen. But uh, what was the confirmation in, you know, yeah, for In it? my life, the Lord had, uh, what, what was very important to me was Eucharistic adoration, intercessory prayer, especially for the souls because after my father's death, intercessory prayer, redemptive suffering, um, a sacrificial spirit. The Lord would completely bring me to tears with love for the church, with love for priests, but especially for the church. I wanted to see her beautiful and holy and the bride of Christ. Um, as time went on, I did begin to, to intercede uh, in different ways for priests. I didn't know what my mission was. I wanted to know, thanks to Father Roger, who spoke on what is your mission. It was just burning in my heart. I needed to know. So Maria and I we were going to Ireland, and I did do I fasted, I, I, did, I did the consecration to St. Louis Marie de Montfort, mm -hmm. 33-day consecration. I wanted an answer, and I did not get an answer in Ireland. I did, however, get an answer when I got back, and that answer came on Holy Trinity Sunday, mm. which, of course, correlated with my, right. the vision that the Lord gave me at the beginning of the Holy Trinity. And I would like to share with you, if it's possible, I had a very, very vivid dream. I was waiting to receive the Eucharist. I was left out. I followed the priest, and in the room where the priest was were lazy boy chairs with priests sitting on them. And there were women who were feeding them, who were serving them. Now, the Lord made me to understand they're sitting in lazy boy chairs because he wanted me to understand the laxity in in some priests and then he showed me the nuns I did not know they were nuns they were not dressed as nuns but the Lord showed me that they were nuns he made me to understand this and as I genuflected to receive the Lord in the Holy Eucharist I heard the mocking I heard the laughing and it was them that they that were laughing at me and I, I was in shock and as I woke up from this dream I could hear myself speaking Lord have mercy on lukewarm priests that was my mission I incorporated that in everything I did in the holy hour that I led in every prayer and every mass and every sacrifice 
this was what my mission was. This was, this was what God made me for. Mm. And I felt it burning in my heart, I knew. And so fast forward, Maria comes to me and says, what do you think? And um, I thought it was amazing when I heard that the con congregation of the clergy sent out this document for all bishops to read and that they were asking for help for their priests. I thought it was wonderful, but the timing wasn't right. I, I just knew, I sensed. Um, however, after some time and many confirmations from our spiritual directors, our pastor, Father Galen, uh, our chaplain, uh, Bishop Scott McCaig, uh, we decided that we should do it. And uh, one day, as I was walking through my, my bedroom, I was just stopped. We were discerning how to do it. The Lord never allows me to do anything publicly unless He allows me to do it first privately. It's just been the way. So it wasn't a surprise that I, I started becoming bombarded with different thoughts, and it was the Lord speaking to me in this way, not, not with His voice, but in thought. And I remembered different things that, that I've done in my life. And then I started to understand the vision that Maria, Maria had one part and I had the other. And the vision was that this would be a twofold apostolate. It would be for women, for the holiness of women. It would be for the holiness of the priest. It would be win, win, win. Win for the priest, win for the woman, win for the church. It would work through the duty of the moment. Um, it would be, um, uh, beside the duty of the moment, redemptive. It would not be a prayer group. It would be a life offering. That is so key, that we give all. Um, it would also be anonymous. That was very important, that the priest did not know his spiritual mother, that the spiritual mother did not know her priest son. However, the priest would get an opportunity to write to his spiritual mother one time without giving any details of who he is and share his heart as much or as little as he wished. Um, this ministry is a ministry of love. You know, no greater love is there than to give your life for your brothers and that is our scripture reading. Um, so there are spiritual women like yourselves yes. who've been called by God, who are waiting to be connected hmm. to a priest who all he has to do is write a letter about his needs or his whatever, ministry, whatever he wants to say, right? He can write about his struggles because the letter is non-identifiable. Right. There's, um, he doesn't have to worry because there's no, there's no judgment there. And, and because of the anonymity, um, he, he really doesn't have to worry about that. However, the spiritual mother will take that to prayer and everything that she's doing because of the duty of the moon, because of the redemptive suffering, everything that she's going through, mm -hmm. she'll be able to take on. Like if it's a, if it's a biological mother, we pray for our children. Mm -hmm. But if it's a, a mother that, um, if it's a wife that hasn't had um, children, okay. you know, they could say, I have a son. Mm -hmm. So everything that they're doing, it's for that priest. That's what it's, that's the beauty of it. It's a life offering. Right. When you say duty of the moment, what, mm -hmm. does, that, what does that mean, that phrase? The duty of the moment is living your priority at that moment. So depending on your vocation, if you're a mother, your priorities will be different than if you're a religious sister. Or, and so it's just living and asking the Lord and of course, it's something that you just become accustomed to. The Lord puts it in your heart, then do this and do that. It's just something that, that you feel is right at the moment that God is placing in your heart that you should be doing at that moment. How does that relate to the priest that you're praying for? All right, well, let me give you an example, St. Therese. St. Therese would sweep the floor and offer it for her priest. And our sacrifices are nothing. We're just a grain of salt. But when we, when we, um, unite our sufferings with Our Lady and Our Lord, they become everything. We can save souls through those sufferings, through our hiddenness, you know, and doing something small with great love. It doesn't need to be a great feat, you know. Yeah. How do you know what to pray for priests? You say that they can write, that will go to the spiritual mother, they mm -hmm. can tell you particular things, mm -hmm. but there are, how do you know kind of in general mm -hmm 
what, what is a priest called to? How mm -hmm. should we pray for him? Mm -hmm. uh, I think you mentioned some of your writings, St. Alphonsus Lacouri mm -hmm. wrote to, to priests or something to, to tell them about their vocation and their calling. Uh, how do you connect? Well, when I, used to, when I used to go to Mass and I would see the priests celebrating Mass, I knew that they were doing, it was something more than celebrating Mass. What their role was, what their duty was, their, their dignity. And I just, um, I just wanted to know more about it, so I started looking up, um, just Googling. And I just put, duties and dignity of the priesthood. Little did I know, this document came up with St. Alphonsus Liguori, and it was one of the most beautiful documents because it explained the role of the priest. Mm -hmm. And it made me appreciate even more, yeah. you know, yeah. the representative of right. Jesus Christ. He's important. It's, it's this, you know, he celebrates the sacraments, the sacraments of our beautiful Catholic Church. And, and um, because of the Eucharist, and, uh, you know, I said, well, if, he, if, he, if we don't pray for, for the priest, how do we have the right. Eucharist? Mm -hmm. And so it made me appreciate more who the priest was. Right. Right. And it's so beautiful. I mean, I had the privilege of being a, a lay associate working at a church for Catholic priests. And, and um, you know, they, they bring you, they work the church, they're administrators, they're doing hospital visits. They're, I mean, th th what they are called to bear is a lot. It's, they're physically exhausted, emotionally exactly. exhausted, and then they're under spiritual attack. Yes, that's And then they're right. just trying to work at their own holiness. Mm -hmm. And so they need people to be praying for them. Absolutely. And so for the beauty of your great group to come that God has raised up, and, and you may never even meet your priest, but, you, and, but the beautiful thing about prayer is when you're before adoration, God is laying upon your heart exactly. his needs. Exactly. exactly. So he's going before you to say, Pray for my son, this is a situation. Pray for my son, whatever. And you don't even know the guy. That's I mean, right. you know, you don't you don't know his face, you don't know his name, yeah. but you know him in your spirit yeah. because that's where he's been birthed inside exactly. of you. Exactly. Exactly. We believe that this is something that it it just isn't put on our hearts now. This is something that that the Lord has placed within us from our mother's womb. Mm -hmm. This yeah. is our mission. That's right. mm -hmm. And like everyone has a mission. And uh, the, he has given us everything we need in our hearts to fulfill it. Right. And our experience is that as soon as women hear about our apostolate and read that there's a love for the church that starts developing and a sacrificial spirit and different desires, they connect and they realize this is what God is doing with mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a particular uh, charism to be a spiritual mother, a particular mm -hmm. intercessory charism. Well, we're going to go straight to an email. It says this, the priest at our parish is one of the lukewarm priests uh. that you spoke of. He is more interested in being a pal or one of the gang instead of our spiritual father. Mm. Besides praying for him, can you suggest practical methods to help him to his true calling? And this is Susan from Detroit. Mm. That's a very good question. It's a very good question. Well, if um, it sounds like this person has an intercessory heart. And when you have an intercessory heart, you can't help it but continue to pray. Just continue to pray for this priest. And, and just keep affirming him of his priesthood. Thank him all the time. Um, yeah. I think well, that's well all you one can do. of the things we used to just do, and I'm not a spiritual mother in that way, but we would just send our priests love notes, mm -hmm. and then at certain things we would bring pre our priests and our deacons. We just bring them cookies, just to say thank you, just something, just to say because everyone is pulling and tugging at them mm -hmm. in so many different directions, mm -hmm. and just say God's got you on my radar, Father, and I'm mm -hmm. just praying for you. Yeah, I, just, you know? I think it's so great just to go to him and say, you know, Father. Is there any way I can serve you? 
Mm -hmm. I'm really for you and I'm praying for you. Mm -hmm. If there's anything I could do or these group of women who pray, mm -hmm. that we are here for you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that we agree with everything the Father does mm -hmm. or that you know, he's lukewarm or that he's whatever. You know, he's surrendered his life to mm -hmm. this calling right. and to affirm him as a person and That's as a right. priest yes. and, and the difficulties of that calling, saying, we're for you, Father. Exactly, you know? and I think little sacrifices go a long way united with Mary. And besides prayer, you know, God cannot turn down love. You know, it's who he is. Our time is moving by. I want right. to know the, some of the other components, the disciplines. Okay. If, if there's a woman out there and says, well, I like to be involved, but how much do I have All to right. do or what is it about? It's very important to us that we don't inflict uh, more problems, uh, you know, uh, difficulty in a woman's life. So the Lord made it clear that he wants it to be something that works within their vocation. Now, practicing Catholic women are coming to us. We have prayer warriors. We have amazing spiritual mothers that I want to say hi to because I know they're all watching. Um, and it's very, very simple. We do a daily prayer, uh, a daily prayer offering. Uh, we, we do go before the bishop. Um, let, let me start here. We have an information session first and women that are interested do come and hear us. Then we have a formation weekend. And at that formation weekend, our chaplains and other priests speak about what's going on in our apostolate. And they have s talks on different subjects pertaining to our apostolate. Then we go into an induction ceremony once the woman has discerned that this is something that God is calling her to. Um, and at that induction ceremony, we, after Mass, we make a promise to the Lord that we give all, all that we are, um, to the Lord for His Church, for this particular priest, but also for all priests. Um, the women themselves uh, receive a prayer card, a daily prayer card. So they're basically just renewing this promise. But whether they renew it or not, this is the promise they've now made before the Lord. They've given themselves. And they say this every day. Weekly, we do Our Lady of Seven Sorrows Rosary, which is something that is very important to myself, to Maria, to our apostolate. We propagate Our Lady of Seven Sorrows. It is our mother of sorrows who would like this rosary propagated. And it's, it's an, a very old devotion in the church, starting from the Servites, then to uh, St. <laughs> uh, Bridget of Sweden. Right. And through her visions, uh, the Lord gave seven promises to those who, or Our Lady gave seven promises to those who, who, um, oh, who recite. Enter into who the yes, right. enter, exactly, who enter, yeah. into, enter into the sorrows that she, that she felt who think of her. So it's, it's a, a beautiful, beautiful um, rosary, a very important to us because we're doing Our Lady's will. And um, so they do do this. And then we ov obviously want them to go once a month to confession and, and you know do all that type of thing. Once a year we do uh, the 33-day consecration to St. Louis-Marie de Montfort. We start it together on a certain day and we finish it on September 15th, right. mm -hmm. the Feast of Our Lady of mm -hmm. Sorrows. Mm -hmm. um, we don't do it together, we're not a right. prayer group, but we we unite in prayer. That's right. where our strength is, our power. We're going to have to so. conclude at this point and it sounds like you just started. We're just starting, but yes, there's so much to say and we tried so hard to go faster. It's and a beautiful journey that you are on and so we invite uh, all the ladies out there who have this sense of a heart for your priest to want nothing for them but good and to intercede and to pray and to unite with others who are doing that. If there's a priest out there mm -hmm. and you're saying, gee, I, I'd like to have some ladies that they want nothing from me but to bless my life and to intercede for me. Mm -hmm. Go to spiritualmotherhoodofpriests.ca. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Well, you're an important part of our family, and you know, you can join us live right here on At Home, and you can be a member in our studio audience. All you need to do is contact the EWTN Pilgrimage Department, and do that by pilgrimages at EWTN.com, 
or give them a jingle at 205-271-2966 and you can be a part of our audience. You could take a, a beautiful journey up to Hansville um, and just come on down up over wherever you are to Irondale, Alabama. It's a beautiful spiritual journey. So many people are finding yeah. it so meaningful, even more meaningful sure. now to go up to Hansville yes. mm -hmm. and visit Mother's Resting Place. Mm -hmm. And when people are coming through here in Birmingham, they're saying, you can really go there and be right. Yeah. yeah. So it's so beautiful, so meaningful. So And we've don't had put people from Spain. We've yeah, had people all from over the Kuwait. World. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, right? it sure is. When you, when you ask them to come, they really come. Come on. Right. We're yeah, here. come. <laughs> so We're waiting good. for you. <laughs> so welcome, Father. Welcome at oh, home with Jim you. and Joy. How are you? Oh, I'm great. Thanks You're be busy. to God. Mm -hmm. Very busy, you know, but, uh, but having fun. There you, you go. Know, that's important. That's, uh, having fun and... The joy of the Lord is our strength. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes. It's really Amen. a part of mother's spirituality, That's isn't right. it? It's serious, it's earnest, but it should also be a joy and should be fun and have humor along the way. Of course. And that was really her spirituality. We have a good time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you've heard of this apostolate, Spiritual Mothers of Priests, or that, that ministry? Oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard of it before. And it's a, it's a beautiful work of God. It's so, so essential, so needed in this day and age. And, you know, I was so edified and... Uh, by by the by their testimonies first of all I mean the, this was this was right. this was powerful amazing mm -hmm. how God worked in both of their lives and yeah. both the Marias and uh, and then to see what the fruit of that now and where He's led them to pray for priests and in a in a very maternal way mm -hmm. you know there there's a, when when it's done in a maternal way it's it's so much more pure there's much right. more care and concern in that right. it's done it's done very motherly mm -hmm. you know and uh, that's yeah. always consoling and comforting. For the priests. Mm -hmm. It was speaking yeah. in the back to the Marias, yes. if, I, if I got it right. And somehow the word protection came up, mm -hmm. and they said, that, that's really important to us. So it's, it's nurturing, yeah. it's maternal. Part of that maternity mm -hmm. is protection. And that's so right. they're like, we want to protect you know, our children, our mm -hmm. sons, our priests. Mm -hmm. Isn't that nice to have that kind of yeah. reinforcement there with you, that there are people who are just saying, we want to defend, we want to protect. They're not speaking physically mm -hmm. necessarily, they're speaking about the weapons of the warfare, you That's know, right. being spiritual weapons yeah. and to intercede for this priest. Mm -hmm. And they, they're anonymous to one another. Right. But uh, it, it must be really so meaningful, though, you have somebody it like is, that. It is. It's very meanif meaningful. Uh, like I said, very consoling and comforting. Uh, you know, as a priest, we, you know, our duty, our, our duty, I mean, we're conformed to, to Jesus Christ, the high priest, through our consecration. And we go and we, we, we preach. We're, we're called to preach, uh, to, uh, to shepherd the faithful. Um, to uh, you know, celebrate divine worship. Uh, you know, we we do this by also uh, we go alleviating the the sick and the suffering, uh, offering the sacrament of, of reconciliation, sacrament of penance. You know, and this is uh, this this is beautiful work. This is uh, in be, being in union with Jesus, acting in the person of Jesus Christ. But at the same time, we're experiencing what Jesus experiences, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, this could be very prayerful and, and very intimate. But it's it can be very exhausting too, yeah. be painful. you know, and yeah. and painful. But mm -hmm. it's 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 all part of the prayer of of the priest's life is is becoming united to Jesus in that way and feeling what He feels um, and carrying the sins of the people, the burdens, yeah. and uh, and then and then priests on top of that, many of them have to wear other hats. Right. You know, some of them are principals of schools. They sit on board of governors or overseeing projects. Uh, at the at the parish, you know, for construction and things like this and expansion and stuff. And so. Uh, so yeah, you know, it really kind of weighs on you. Well, it's and a lot. It's and a, you, they're doing lot, RCIA, yeah. they're yeah, doing all the yeah. discipling. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's yeah. a lot. Yeah. It is a lot. Yeah, it is a lot again. But again, it's a, it's a beautiful life mm -hmm. and, yeah. and uh, a life where you got to have fun. But, but we do need those prayers, you know, because yeah. uh, sometimes, you know, you get tired and there's the devil. And right. but we rely on those prayers of yeah. all the, the faithful out there yeah. who, you know, support us uh, yeah. again with their intercession. But, uh, you know, also give, providing moral support and encouragement, that's always good to hear. You know, and those cookies are good, too. Mm -hmm. I enjoy them. <laughs> yeah, you know. Uh, I mean, don't send too many, yeah. you know, because especially when, when you're tired yeah. and you don't have a lot of time. Hey, yeah. that's your food, you know. No. I can't believe you're making an appeal for cookies <laughs> right on that home with Jim and Joy. This is unbelievable. No, but good. if Father Anthony did that yeah. one time, he was talking yeah. about candy and everybody yeah. wanted to everybody send candy. Everybody wants candy. Like, yeah, we don't need a lot of candy, <laughs> then, you know. Yeah. yeah. No, but it's true. But, I mean, just the beautiful appeal uh, for priests, yeah. um, for prayer. 
I mean, mm -hmm. it's so, and it is. I mean, you have a mother. They don't want to be mm -hmm. your mother, but they, they've been called by yeah, God spiritually. To, to spiritually pray for you, sure. to spiritually adopt you, and to love you through your faith journey mm -hmm. so that you finish right. strong, you finish you know, uh, full of God, full of hope, mm -hmm. and the, a holier man than when you began. Yeah. Right? Uh, amen. Amen. That's exactly right. And, you know, as I was saying, the, the priest, um, you know, he's, he's in union with Jesus Christ or stri and always striving for a deeper union. And, uh, you know, Jesus, even Jesus had women there, women supporting him, women mm -hmm. praying for him. You know, and this is, this is what this reminds mm -hmm. us of here, mm -hmm. especially his most blessed mother who was always with him throughout the journey. Amen. Right. That's yeah. so well said, Father. Yeah. Why don't you give us a blessing and Lord, strengthen us? Lord God Almighty, we thank you for blessing us with the priesthood and this ministry of uh, spiritual motherhood. And we ask you, God, to bring us your joy, to give us your strength so that we may persevere in doing your work. We make our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and we ask you to bless us. And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, thank, thank you for you, being Father. at home with Jim and Joy. You are an important part of the family. We pray that more and more you sense his divine love for you. God bless you and all of your loved ones. Keep it on EWTN. Bye now. Bless you.